Good morning. Welcome to worship at Calvary United Methodist Church here in the beautiful Shenandoah Valley of Virginia. We're so glad that you're a part of this celebration and a part of our family today as we begin a brand new series called Living Faith. Throughout the month of October, we'll be diving into the New Testament book of James, exploring what it meant to the early church and how it speaks to us today. Lessons from James will be at the heart of our services each Sunday, and we'll have a chance to go even deeper at a new Bible study beginning this Wednesday evening. There will be a session in the chapel from 6.30 to 7.15 each week for those folks who are ready to return to in-person gatherings. And there will be an online session open to everyone from 7.30 to 8.15. Check the description of today's video for links that will allow you to let us know that you're coming on Wednesday or to join the online study with us. You'll also find there links to our virtual connection card where you can tell us that you are here today and share concerns that you have or ways that we can be praying for you. There's also links there to our bulletin and prayer list and to the website you can visit to make an offering. If God is calling you to support the mission and ministry of Calvary in that way, Now, let us lift our voices and our hearts in praise as we sing together wonderful words of life. Sing them over again to me, wonderful words of life. Let me more of their beauty see, wonderful words of life. Words of life and beauty, teach me faith and duty. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Christ the Blessed One gives to all wonderful words of life. Sinnerless to the loving call, wonderful words of life. All so freely given, wooing us to heaven. Beautiful words, wonderful words of life. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Sweetly echo the gospel call, wonderful words of life. Offer pardon and peace to all, wonderful words of life. Jesus only friends. It's good to be back with you this week. Today I'm really excited because we're going to start a new series with Pastor David and all of the scriptures that we're going to be exploring and learning and talking about for the next few weeks come from one of my favorite books of the Bible, the book of James. When I was growing up my granny used to always tell me that James was her favorite book and so it has a special place in my heart. Speaking of when I was growing up, When I was in probably second grade, there was this girl in my class who I thought was so cool. Her name was Tabby, and Tabby used to smile really uniquely. She would smile really big and really wide, and she would stick her tongue out between her teeth. 
And so being a second grader who thought that her friend was just the coolest person in the whole world, I started smiling that way too. And when my pictures came home from second grade, my mom said, Scarlett, what's this new smile that you're trying on? I thought it was really cool because I thought Tabby was really cool. But isn't that the way it is with Jesus? We think Jesus is just amazing. And when we spend time learning about Jesus, we start to act more like Jesus. And we want to be more like Jesus. Now, I can't tell you what Jesus' smile looked like, but I can tell you what his heart was full of. His heart was full of grace and hope and forgiveness and love. And as we learn and grow through these weeks, as we, as we talk about the book of James, we're going to talk about how our faith is lived out through our lives, how our faith and our actions are linked together. And so friends, this week, as you go about your days, I want you to think of ways that you can live out your faith, ways that you can make the belief that Jesus loves you come to life around you. How can you share the love of God with the people that you meet this week? Those are good ideas. Think about ways that you can connect your faith into action. Be the hands and the feet of Jesus every day this week. We love you. We'll see you next week. Good morning, Calvary family. Will you join me as we pray together? God of grace and mercy, what a joy it is to gather in your presence from these places where we are each beckoned closer to you and surrounded by your love. Thank you for the ways you show us how much you care for us, for the love notes you've written to us throughout nature, for the reminders you share with us through friends and family and even strangers. In spite of the hard things we go through, you constantly remind us through your wonderful words of life that you will never leave or forsake us, and you never have. Loving Lord, how grateful we are for your abiding presence, your comfort, and your peace. Forgive us, Lord, when we fail to show that same love, when our actions break your peace, when we forget the depth of your love for others or even ourselves. Forgive us for our selfishness, for our lack of faith, or those times we rush headlong into the unknown without inviting you to lead us. We ask, Lord, for an extra measure of care and compassion over those who are suffering this day, for those who are fighting battles beyond our comprehension, for those in positions of authority, those whose decisions affect so many others and the ones affected by those decisions. You tell your people that when we humble ourselves, seek your face, turn from our selfishness, and call on your name, you will respond. You will bring healing. We trust in that promise, Lord, and we need your healing, your peace, and your abiding presence. As we draw closer to you, God, put within us a burning desire to fully seek you and your will. Stir our hearts to action that's made evident not only in words, but through our hands, our feet, our lives. You love us, God, and you take care of us. May we do likewise with each other and our neighbors, each and every one of them. And as we walk through each day, may we remember to seek your counsel, to pray as we do now, as our Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning, Calvary worshipers. I'm Barbara Sneed, and I'm going to be reading the scripture from the book of James, chapter 2, verses 14 through 26. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if you have faith but do not have works? Can faith save you? If a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, keep warm, and eat your fill, and yet you do not supply their bodily needs. What is the good of that? So faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I by my works will show you my faith. You believe God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you senseless person, that faith apart from works is barren? Was not our ancestor Abraham justified by works when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was brought to completion by the works. Thus the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. Likewise, was not Rahab the prostitute also justified by works when she welcomed the messengers and sent them out by another road? For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is also dead. Come, O Christians, be committed to the service of the Lord. with one accord. 
Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable and pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. As United Methodist Christians, we are thinking people. We remember Jesus encouraging his followers to believe in him as they believed in God, and we seek to follow Paul's instruction to let the same mind be in us that was in Christ Jesus. We've heard again and again that it is by grace we are saved through faith. And this is not our own doing, but the gift of God working in us and through us. Throughout its history, the church has sought to engage people's hearts and minds with the good news of God's love. Hymns and creeds, three-point sermons and stained-glass windows have told and retold the stories of Moses and the Israelites, of Jesus and the apostles, of the prophets, priests, sinners, and saints whose lives and beliefs form the foundation of Christian doctrine. John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist movement, held orthodox teaching in such high regard that he began by placing his followers not in distinct churches, all their own, but in small groups where they could be taught the fundamentals of the faith and then held accountable for their own behavior in light of the gospel. It's a model of discipleship that we still use today. We send our children to youth group and confirmation, praying that they will explore and embrace the faith of their parents and grandparents as their very own. We read devotionals, attend workshops, and sign up for Bible studies that help us discern who and what we should believe. We even gather on Sunday mornings to listen to someone talk for 15 or 20 minutes, hoping that he or she will bring a word from God, a word that will instruct and illumine and inspire us. If we're true to our roots and to our call as Christians, then we spend a lot of time thinking about our faith. In fact, in this highly critical and connected world we live in, where an endless amount of information is literally at our fingertips every hour of every day, we might reasonably be concerned about someone who did not take their beliefs seriously. The work of believing. Things like reading the Bible for ourselves and examining our own conscience and values is a vital part of our faith journey. It allows us to discover and proclaim our identity as beloved children of God it frees us to respond with compassion and clarity when people question our faith. And it inspires us always to continue growing in grace and love. All of this, all of this thinking, believing part of our faith is a very good thing. But we must approach it with caution. 
Because you see, we run into problems when we're so focused on what we know that we ignore the mystery of faith. When we need to have everything sorted out just right, we can be discouraged. Because just when we begin thinking of faith in those terms, like it's algebra or chemistry or something else that we can master and then pass on to others in a tidy little package, along comes Jesus, who's more concerned with how we live than what we know. Jesus is always challenging people to be in loving relationship, especially with the outcast and forgotten with tax collectors and prostitutes, with lepers and hypocrites. The truth is that the Jesus of the Gospels doesn't spend a lot of time telling us what to believe. Instead, he tells us how to live. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the meek and the merciful. Blessed are the peacemakers. And then he shows us what that looks like by inviting broken and discarded people to eat at his table, by serving others even when it is inconvenient or embarrassing, by rejecting the seduction of power and the temptation of violence, and finally, by laying down his own life so that we might live abundantly and eternally. And so, in his letter to the church, James calls upon this tradition of Jesus' life and ministry to call us to a living faith, a transformation of heart and mind and soul and body that goes beyond intellectual belief and touches every aspect of our lives. He says that faith by itself, if it doesn't have works, is dead. And of course, we already know this. We know that there is no bigger stumbling block to unbelievers than Christians who talk the talk but don't walk the walk. We know that our actions speak louder than our words. That people are looking to us in the church to set an example of faithful love and service and generosity. We know that works of mercy and justice don't replace our faith, but they complete it. To illustrate the point, James describes a believer who sees a brother or sister naked and hungry but does nothing to help. If you say to such a person, go in peace, keep warm, and eat your fill, and yet you do nothing to supply their bodily needs, James asks, what is the good of that? He simply won't let us escape the fact that God's Spirit is uniquely present with the poor and the oppressed, Those whom the Old Testament identifies as the alien, the orphan, and the widow. Our faith is made fully alive when we stand in solidarity with these, our siblings in God's family. When we recognize God's presence in their struggles and their joys. And when we're willing to sacrifice our own pleasure or security in order to end their suffering. One commentator has said that James makes the Christian community's response to the poor a touchstone for testing the authenticity of their faith. We might not disagree with this, but we do tend to broaden the list to include other things as a gauge for how faithful we are Things like going to church or reading the Bible, smiling at people when we meet them, obeying our parents, or taking care of our families. To be sure, all of those are good things that we want to encourage, but honestly, none of them are very hard 
most of the time, they're not quite the same as Rahab risking her own life in order to help the people of Israel reach the promised land. Or Daniel refusing to bow down before the king, even if it meant his death. Those kind of works. The kind of works that God calls us to as Christians. They demand considerable courage and radical faith. There are a lot of contemporary examples we might point to of that kind of faith. I hope some come to your mind when you reflect on it. But perhaps none for me is more striking than the Pennsylvania Amish community of nickel mines, which if you can think back all the way to 2006, was the place where people responded to the brutal murder of five young schoolgirls by immediately and unconditionally reaching out in love to the family of the killer who had taken his own life following the attacks. Within minutes of hearing the news of what had happened, the grandfather of one of the dead girls warned his friends and family that we must not think evil of this man. Later that evening, members of the community traveled to the man's home to visit and comfort his wife and parents and extended family. One Amish man held the killer's sobbing father in his arms for more than an hour, sharing with him the peace and forgiveness that comes only from Christ. About 30 members of the Amish community attended the man's funeral, and his wife was one of very few outsiders invited to join them as they remembered and celebrated the lives of the children who had been lost. When financial gifts began pouring in from all around the world, the community sent much of it on to help provide counseling and healing for the man's family. Friends, that level of forgiveness and grace isn't an accident. And it doesn't come just from getting your theology right or from having all the right words to describe God and the world. It's a living faith, a commitment that is cultivated over a lifetime of following Jesus in good times and in bad. You see, members of that community were convinced that Jesus means it, literally, when he calls his followers to turn the other cheek, to renounce the sword, to repay evil with good, and always to love their enemies. And they knew that these practices were not easy for the first people Jesus shared them with. And they're not meant to be easy for us either. But they also knew that there is no other way to live fully and faithfully as children of God. The only way they could survive this great tragedy was by doing what they had always done loving and serving and forgiving their neighbors, especially the poor in spirit, in the name of Jesus. Now, it's safe to say that James would object anytime Christians neglect those practices of the faith, anytime Christians ignore the poor and the needy among God's people. But he is especially upset in our reading today because their neglect has taken on the appearance of religious piety by saying to people in need, go in peace, keep warm, and eat your fill. Without lifting a finger to help, the believers have corrupted God's peace, which passes all understanding and is available to all people, and they have forgotten the bread of life which is theirs 
because of the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Living faith is not about getting our words right. It's about participating in God's ongoing work of creation and recreation, of healing and transformation in the world. It's not piously saying, God's bless, God bless you. It's humbly and boldly allowing ourselves to be the blessing that God has for others. Living faith. The faith that James calls for and that Jesus models and that we long for in our lives today transcends every rite and ritual of the church. Just as it breaks down the walls of comfortable individualism that so often reign among us. But still, we learn this faith through the church's central practices of worship. The words we share in scripture and in hymns and in affirmations testify to faith made fully alive. And when we let them, They hold the power to change our hearts, to transform our lives, and to reshape the whole world into the family of faith. This community that we call our home, this body that helps us find meaning and hope for our lives into our fellowship. God invites people that we might never have considered befriending otherwise. And God insists that we welcome them as sisters and brothers here. In the church of Jesus Christ, saints and sinners, seasoned believers and new converts, Hokies and Cavaliers, Trump Republicans and Biden Democrats, worship God and receive grace together. The life of the church is a bold witness to unity in the face of violence and division. We're called to build a community where we can acknowledge our common dependence on God and where we can commit to living together as citizens of God's kingdom. Where the categories of first and last, best and worst, strong and weak, categories that so often feel so important, categories that we build so much of our self-identity around start to fall away as we enter into the presence of a mystery that unites us with believers in every place and age and with the God that we all serve together. So as we lift our hearts together now, and as we seek to be the kind of disciples that God is calling for over the days and weeks and years ahead, may we embody a living faith. May we be eager to be doers of the word and not hearers only. May we prepare ourselves for the transformation that comes from a genuine encounter with one another and with God. And may we discover in this holiest of tasks the grace that binds us together as co-workers in service of our gracious and generous and living Lord. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. Who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered on the Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven. And sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From then he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. Believe in the Holy Spirit. 
the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, resurrection of the body, the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Take myself, and I will be ever only all for thee. Friends, that's what living faith does. It leads us to direct all that we have, all that we do, all that we are to God's service. In this week ahead and all through your life, may you discover God's grace and proclaim it. May you feel God's mercy and share it. May you know God's love and live it. If there's a way that our church can serve you this week, or a need you see in the community that we might help to meet, please let us know. If you'd like to get connected with our ministry in a new way, either in person or online, reach out to me or to our church office, wherever you are, and however you're involved in the life of our church, please know that we love you, and we're so thankful for you. And even more, please know that God's love for you will never end. Go in peace. Amen. <laughs>